Bienvenue. Bienvenue à tous et à toutes à, à cette conférence de la série intitulée « Voir grand, Big Thinking » au Congrès de la Fédération des sciences humaines du Canada. Je m'appelle Gary Leben. D'abord, je veux remercier nos hôtes Brock University, la Société royale du Canada, et aussi la Fédération elle-même et le Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines du Canada. Un tel congrès ne se, ré se réalise pas sans beaucoup de travail, une bonne organisation et un peu de bonne chance. Mais voilà, nous y sommes arrivés. Today, I proudly wear two hats. The first as Vice President Research of Brock University, where we are honored to be hosting Congress, to be hosting you, and to be collaborating on this Big Thinking lecture series with our nationally esteemed partners, the Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences and the Royal Society of Canada. The second hat I wear, speaking to, na to you now at this wonderful Big Thinking event, is as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Induction into the Society was certainly one of the highlights of my professional career, and I'm very honored to be acting as our representative today. Most recently, Brock, the RSC, and FedCan collaborated to present a Big Thinking lecture at the annual meeting of the RSC last November, in which Brock's professor, Kevin Key, gave a characteristically thought-provoking presentation on the future of scholarship. Today's lecture represents yet another successful collaboration, and I have very good reason to look forward to a long and continued partnership between Brock University and the Royal Society of Canada. It may seem unusual that uh, the RSC should be supporting such an event which features a man best known for his fiction. Indeed, there was a time, not so very long ago, when this would have been surprising for an organization steeped uh, in society in the way the Royal Society um, is. Yet the notion of a national academy sitting apart and aloof is far removed, indeed, is very far removed from the dynamic multidisciplinary fellowship I see around me today. The mandate of the Royal Society of Canada is to recognize intellectual achievement by Canadians, to promote these achievements more broadly, to promote scholarship more broadly, and to advise Canadians on matters of national importance. The pursuit of truth, of excellence in execution, the relentless inquiry into what appears to be the impossible, the creativity required to turn the impossible into the possible, and the changing of conventional, conventional wisdom. These are the threads that underlie both science and art, and they are the other traits that unite our fellows. It's been less than 10 years since the RSC created the Division of Arts, and yet in that time, the arts have cleaved themselves to the core of the society. Through the election of musicians, artists, and creators to the fellowship, and our collaboration on projects such as this one. Canadians renowned for their achievements such as Margaret Atwood and Ben Hepner are now rightly recognized as fellows of, national, of Canada's National Academy. The embracing of the arts is not least of the revitalization projects the RSC has embarked upon. More ambitious, more daring, and more demanding, the RSC will elect at its AGM in November in Quebec City, the inaugural cohort of the College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. The scope and scale of this project is unique in the world. This unitary college, undivided by silos or disciplines, will comprise over 50 emerging scholars, artists, and scientists from across the country who will shape the future of Canadian scholarship. Indeed, it will instantiate the theme of this year's Congress at Brock, Borders Without Boundaries, Frontières Sans Limites. Let me now turn to our speaker. It is a special pleasure for me to be introducing one of Canada's most respected writers, Mr. Lawrence Hill. You are no doubt familiar with his award-winning novel, The Book of Negroes, but Mr. Hill is truly a man without boundaries, multilingual and multi-talented. He is not only a novelist, but a journalist, a parliamentary correspondent, and an honorary patron and volunteer with Crossroads International, supporting programs for women and girls in the West African countries, Niger, Cameroon, and Mali, through the uh, Aminata Fund. He has written nine books and worked in no less than four countries. In 2005, he asked himself a question on the theme of borders without boundaries and won a National Magazine Award for his answer. The article, 
Is Africa's Pain Black America's Burden was published in The Walrus. The theme of Mr. Hill's lecture today is Blood, the Stuff of Life, drawn from his newest work of nonfiction published in September 2003 by the House of Anansi Press. It is a personal consideration of the physical, social, and psychological aspects of blood and how it defines us, how it unites us, how it divides us. Lawrence Hill and I had a wonderful, uh, wonderful time just a few minutes ago chatting here in the front row. Uh, it was, uh, it's been a delight for me. Uh, you recognize immediately people that are in, both interesting and interested in just about everything. Um, please join me in welcoming, uh, welcoming a very big, big thinker, Mr. Lawrence Hill. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, je suis très content de vous rejoindre aujourd'hui. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences and to the Royal uh, Society for sponsoring this event. And I agree with Gary that sometimes we make too much of the distinctions between those who write fiction and those who produce scholarship. Uh, most scholars that I know or have met love fiction and often feel inspired by it and feel that it, it uh, personifies sometimes the very core of what they're interested in working on in their academic worlds. And very few novelists that I know uh, don't rely heavily on nonfiction to produce and imagine and research their own works. I felt that, that I was living in university libraries for pretty well all of the nine books I've written, and, uh, and I couldn't possibly have produced them without, without the work of scholars uh, on whose shoulders I stand, even when writing fiction. So uh, I think there's much to bring us together, uh, those who write fiction and those who produce scholarship. I'm here to speak with you today about blood. I find it difficult to imagine uh, blood without thinking of mothers. They have to cease their monthly bleedings when it comes time to nourish us in their wombs, and they have to spill blood when it comes time to push us out into the world. I appreciate the blood that the, my own mother shed on my behalf. Her name is Donna Hill, and she's an 86-year-old civil rights activist. Some 61 years ago, she shook her white Republican friends and family to the core when she, when she fell in love with a black graduate student in Washington, D.C., married him, and moved the next day to Toronto, where they raised my brother, sister, and me. Being an all-around contrarian, my mother is not known for her tact. A year ago, when I told her that I'd been invited to deliver the Massey lectures, she said, hey, that's great, Larry, but why'd they pick you? <laughs> this same mother of mine keeps her favorite quote posted to her refrigerator door. It's said to come from the lips of the writer Philip Roth. Quote, when a writer is born into a family, that family is finished. <laughs> she has a point. I admit it. I wouldn't be terribly pleased if one of my five children announced at the kitchen table that they decided to write a family memoir. As I explained to my own mother, my 2013 Massey lectures were not memoirs, but a personal meditation on blood and identity. A social history of coffee or sugar will reveal fascinating details about history, transatlantic relations, economics, and injustice. I imagined blood, the stuff of life, as a short, idiosyncratic social history of blood. My five Massey lectures all explored blood and identity. Who am I? Who are you? How are we tied? What rules govern us? In what ways do our notions, some ancient, and others recent of blood affect individual and collective belonging. How does blood unite us and how does it divide us? Blood brings out some of our most noble instincts in times of tragedy, such as 9-11 or the Boston Marathon bombings. People rush to the blood banks. Some people give blood or blood parts over and over again. One woman whom I interviewed, Raymond Marius of St. Boniface, Manitoba, had to endure two miscarriages as a result of the rhesus, or RH disease. Her blood was incompatible with that of the fetuses she lost. Later, so that other women would not have to lose their babies, Mrs. Marius donated her plasma well over a thousand times over a 42-year period. Blood giving is the ultimate act of philanthropy. Nobody thanks you. In most cases, 
Nobody pays you. Nobody, not even the recipients of your donation, knows who you are or that you gave. But just as blood can bring out the best of us, it can also ignite our worst instincts. Think of genocide. Going back as far as the 15th century Spanish Inquisition, when despots and murderers have sought to justify mass killings, they've generally alluded to the so-called impurity of their victim's blood. Blood looms powerfully in our imaginations. No other bodily tissue or fluid competes with blood when it comes time to capturing our thoughts and providing us with metaphors for seeing ourselves and understanding life. And no other bodily substance inspires as much fear as blood. Like many people who've survived a healthy but rambunctious childhood, I've seen my own blood spill a few times. The memory of these incidents still captures my imagination. One summer morning, I was on all fours playing hide and seek on a Toronto schoolyard when my left wrist began to tingle. I looked down and noticed a broken beer bottle. Turning my hand, I saw more blood than seemed right. It was pouring out of me. I stood, let out a cry, crossed the street, and began running. We lived 10 houses up the street, less than 200 meters away. I got ready to shout out for my mother just as soon as she could hear me. Would I have to go to the hospital? How many stitches would it take to impress my friends? This was a deep cut, lots of blood. Perhaps I would need 20 stitches. Three or four wouldn't earn bragging rights. As I ran, I held out my left arm to direct the splashing blood onto every single sidewalk panel. I slowed when necessary to ensure that the right the, that the bright red trail remained unbroken. Later, I wanted to be able to walk up and down the street with my friends and say, look, that's my blood. Once I reached 20 Beverage Drive, I turned into the driveway, forgot about the trail of blood, and began screaming, by now hyperventilating. I terrified my mother when I burst into the house with blood still flowing from me. She drove me to the hospital. A few hours later, with three or four measly stitches in my wrist, I was back home. Inspecting the sidewalk proved something of a disappointment. The dramatic red trail had already turned rust brown. No one would recognize it as blood unless I pulled it out and insisted. I told a friend or two, but they were so unimpressed that I gave up with the story. I studied the spatter every day as I walked up and down the street. My blood clung to the sidewalk for a respectable period of time, a good week or so until rain washed it away. Looking back, I wonder about the mad impulse to hold out my arm and splash every sidewalk panel. I wanted to mark the earth with my own sacred fluid. Look here, this is me. This is proof of my very life, here in this long line of bloody splotches on the sidewalk. The blood had appeared so fresh and hot when it was spilling. Hours later, transformed from red to mud brown, my accident could no longer be heralded as sacred because the trail I had left no longer looked like blood. One night, while preparing to go to bed, my stepdaughter, Beatrice Friedman, about six years old at the time, was discussing her identity with her mom, my wife, Miranda. I was not in the room, but was told that the conversation touched upon whether Beatrice was Jewish, given that her father is. This is a tricky issue, because Jewish ancestry is traditionally determined by matrilineal descent. Miranda reiterated that Beatrice was related through her family to Jewish people. After pondering this for a moment, Beatrice, who'd been in my life for three years at this point, said, and I'm a little bit black, right? Miranda asked what Beatrice meant to say. Beatrice replied, well, Larry's black and I'm his step, so that makes me a little bit black too. No, that's not how it works, Miranda replied. She went on to say that black identity is seen to derive from your biological parents. In other words, along lines of family blood. Eight years have since passed, and in my family we've all had occasion to chuckle about that conversation. But it was more than merely funny. I find it touching to think of Beatrice identifying with people she loved, her father, me, but running into social barriers every step of the way. Who is to say that Beatrice could not be black or Jewish? if she wanted, who can argue that others have not done so previously. Is your identity an absolute function of family blood? Can you not create an identity for yourself? Given that identity arises from social functions, who's to say that your identity cannot change temporarily or permanently? What if you spent the first 40 years of your life thinking that you descended from Jews only to find out that your biological grandfather was not Jewish at all? 
What if you had always been led to believe that you were white and discovered in your 40s that your father was black and had passed for white and had hidden it from you all those years? All those relatives you never met, are you suddenly one of them by dint of this new discovery? Who is in charge of a person's identity? I've had a lifelong obsession with blood, and I'm not the only one. As both substance and symbol, blood reveals us, divides us, and unites us. We care about blood because it spills it literally and figuratively into every corner of our lives. Blood keeps you alive, for sure. Yet the very blood in your veins can suddenly betray you. One day you feel healthy and you've just hiked up a mountain with the person you most love in the world. And the next day, what you thought was a routine blood test tells you that you have prostate cancer and they'd better decide pronto if you're going to opt for surgery or, re or radiation or tempt the gods by doing nothing at all. Blood is a lubricant of our bodies. It's a river circulating oxygen and supplying nutrients to our cells. But it's more than a sign of your physical health or an omen of your mortality. It has the potential to reveal your most hidden secrets. How is your cholesterol? How much booze have you had? Have you been taking drugs? Are there any other residual traces that might scare off an employer or lead a life insurance company to show you the door? What's been the average amount of sugar in your blood over the past 90 days? Are you the father of that child? Did you cheat in that Olympic snowboard competition? Remember Ross Rubaliati? The BC resident won gold in snowboarding at the 1988 Winter Olympics in Japan. Testers found traces of marijuana in his system. Rubaliati was briefly stripped of his medal, but he won it back after arguing that he had inhaled a drug by means of secondhand smoke at a party. Last year, some 15 years after successfully winning back his Olympic medal, Rubaliati launched a chain of medical marijuana shops. It's called Ross's Gold. <laughs> True story. As Ross Rubaliati could attest, blood won't tell all, but it can tell enough to get you into a whole lot of trouble. On the flip side of trouble lies salvation. Through blood, many people commune with God. For centuries, we spilled blood to seek purification, be released from sin, and placate the gods. Blood speaks to our deepest notions of truth and sanctity. Blood can be used in a court of law to vindicate or convict us. It's one of the most sacred gifts a person can offer, but, it is not, but if it is not safe and pure, that same gift can kill. Blood has been employed in the most outrageous ways to divide human beings and justify crimes beyond heinous but it has the ability to unite us in the most noble ways. In the Massey lectures, I looked at blood from five angles. I touched on the physical properties of blood, on its intersections with medicine, ancient and modern. Beyond how blood functions in the body, I'm interested in how it weighs on the mind and how it shapes our sense of who we are, to whom we belong, and how we experience our humanity. Blood reveals us and protects us. It's a curse, and it can also be a sign. In Exodus, the Israelites were cursed by their blood because they were the slaves of the Pharaoh. But the blood of the lamb protects the Israelites from the avenging angel of death, sent to kill the firstborn sons of all Egyptians who were responsible for the enslavement of the Jews. By smearing lamb's blood on the doorposts, the Hebrews signify their innocence and their homes are passed over. Blood can also be a gift. At the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples that their wine is his blood and instructs them to drink it in memory of him. Blood is not just a symbol in religion. It's a symbol in literature. In storytelling, it's integral to the very way we speak and express ourselves. Iambic pentameter, used in much poetry and Shakespeare's plays, is said to best capture the rhythm of human speech. Its emphasis, an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed one, da-dum, da-dum, da-dum lodges in the mind and seems familiar to the ear. Perhaps that's because it is also the sound of the human heart. It's the sound of blood coursing through our bodies. And this is where we find ourselves when we behold great art, right in the core of our bodies, deep in the midst of our arteries. When I was a child, ready for bedtime, my mother would summon all of her enthusiasm and into nightly poetry readings. My favorite of all was a poem, Disobedience, by A. A. Milne, which begins like this. James, James, Morrison, Morrison, Weatherby, George, Dupree. 
took great care of his mother, though he was only three. <laughs> there, beating alongside our pulse, are the playful, absurd, seductive sounds of the 20th century British writer best known for creating Winnie the Pooh. Milne entered our imaginations first and foremost through our ears by mimicking the sounds of our heart. When you read Milne's poetry aloud, it feels as if you're swimming in your own bloodstream. What we now know about blood seems all the more astounding when we think about where we've come from. For some 2,000 years, philosophers and physicians imagined blood as one of the fundamental characteristics of our body and soul. Let's put, look back 2,000 years. Thanks to Hippocrates and Galen, we came to believe that sickness arose as a result of imbalance between four key parts or humors of the body, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. Galen argued that humors determined your personality. One might be sanguine, choleric, bilious, or melancholic, words and concepts that resonate with us today. Blood, for example, was said to quicken the spirit. But the ancients believed that too much of any humor would upset the balance of one's temperament in health, the elusive mind-body balance we still search for today. It's sobering to imagine how many patients have died from bloodletting over thousands of years. The victims include many famous people. In 1685, Charles II took to his bed one night with a sore foot. The next day, a barber shaved his head and the bloodletting began in Whitehall Palace. In addition to enduring punches and red hot irons, Charles had 24 ounces of blood withdrawn from his arms. He suffered a seizure and died. Napoleon survived the bloodletting and is known to have described medicine as the science of murderers. <laughs> Mozart is thought to have died of shock from bloodletting. George Washington lost his life a day after more than two liters of blood were taken from him to help him get over a cold. To me, the interesting thing about bloodletting is how thoroughly it reflected our belief systems and how long it endured. For two millennia, we believe that a healthy body and a healthy mind should not be burdened by too much blood. So we let our blood run to remove impurities from our body. We let our blood run because we had imaginations. Ever since, we've been obsessed with the idea of balancing our minds and bodies and improving the composition of our blood. Think for a minute of Paula Finley, the Canadian triathlete, who'd been previously ranked number one in the world and who finished dead last crying. It was a very touching, I'm sure all of you saw her on TV at the 2012 London Olympics. What went wrong? She was thought to maybe win that race. She finished last. Five weeks after the race, she announced that she'd been severely anemic during the race. An iron deficiency in the blood is akin to missing an organ or a limb in the world's most competitive triathlon. Lance Armstrong and legions of cyclists who cheated by means of blood doping know that very well. One summer day in the Pyrenees in July of 2004, en route to a sixth Tour de France victory, after completing a mountain stage, uh, every single team member on Lance Armstrong's team uh, refused, re re received a blood transfusion in the bus. The bus pulled over on the side of the mountain, faked uh, engine troubles, and all the athletes lay down on the bus and received blood transfusions as the media and uh, race officials passed by. So they too understood the strength of blood in athletics. Typically, men associate the spilling of or the sight of blood as a byproduct of accident, sport, or war. Blood for men is often romanticized and likened to ritual, honor, and a sign of masculinity. When a woman bleeds during her monthly cycle, it's a symbol of coming of age, of fertility, a sign of her sex. We honor people who spill blood in defending their cause or their nation. Yet since time began, we have vilified women for shedding their monthly blood. Men in ancient Greece seemed befuddled by women's blood. If men bled for days on end, it was surely the result of injury or illness and they would likely perish. So how could women bleed so regularly and still not die? This apparent impetuousness to, moral weakness, to mortal weakness might have been taken as a sign of women's power or of magical qualities barred to men or of some side of gender superiority. But for the most part, men found a more self-aggrandizing theory. Monthly bleeding was proof of women's inferiority. Aristotle wrote that men's blood was superior to that of women. In the human body, he said, heat 
transform nourishment into blood. Men who had sufficient heat were then able to embark on an additional step. They could concoct or transform the blood into semen. On the other hand, Aristotle claimed, women were colder and thus lacked sufficient heat to produce semen. Aristotle's exact words were that the woman is, as it were, an impotent male, for it is through a certain incapacity that the female is female, being incapable of concocting the nutriment in its last stage into semen in women. Because women lacked this ability, Aristotle said, they ended up with too much blood and had to expel it monthly. Aristotle's meditations about the blood of men and women helped entrench notions of male superiority and female inferiority that have lasted for more than 2,000 years. We can't blame sexism on Aristotle alone, nor can we suggest that he was the first to obsess about women and blood. In The Curse, A Cultural History of Menstruation, Janice Delaney lists a litany of other theories by classical Greek and Roman male philosophers about the fundamental problems associated with the blood of women. Empedocles said women evacuate blood because their flesh isn't as dense as the males. Parmenides said women are hotter than men and thus produce an excess of blood, but that they gradually get colder until they reach menopause. Galen theorized that women menstruate because they are idle and not used to hard labor. I so wish that these classical philosophers had been around today. Imagine the expression on Aristotle's face if he were disinterred, reanimated, and required to travel. Let's send him by Greyhound bus to Marymount Manhattan College. Why? Had Aristotle traveled to, Man travel to Manhattan in June of last year, he would have been exposed to Red Howell Moon, dubbed as the world's first menstrual poetry slam. Today, many people will appreciate the organizers' attention to, as they said, bring down the red tent of shame. In 1975, when I was 18 and itching to leave home in Toronto and go off to begin studies at the University of British Columbia, I took a job at Sunnybrook Hospital. For 6.50 an hour, I washed blood off the floors of operating rooms. I was one of only two high school students working in the hospital. The rest of a big team of floor washers were immigrants. Some were Greek, others Portuguese, but that summer, most of my fellow workers were men and women twice my age or more, and hailing from various Caribbean nations, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Barbados, Trinidad, and more. They were all black. Their blackness in my own racial background became pertinent when one day in the men's locker room in the basement of Sunnybrook Hospital, I told a fellow worker that I was black. Say what? He said, dropping his shirt on the changing bench. With naked chest and mouth open, he stared at me. I gulped. I'm black, I told him. This fellow liked me. We'd worked together for weeks, but now he stared, unsure what to make of my words. I took another tack. My father's black. You're shitting me, he said. <laughs> no, I said. And your ma, she white? Yes. I don't believe you, man. It's true. Why would I make that up? Just bring me a picture tomorrow, a picture of you two together. I brought him a picture the next day. Within an hour, every single Caribbean Canadian worker in that hospital had been informed that the curly-haired, white-looking guy who washed floors too fast had a bona fide black father. <laughs> this was the 1970s, and he was a working-class guy from another country. He could not imagine blackness in my ancestry, as, as he might have thought of it, or as he might have thought of it, in my blood. But he liked the discovery. He remained my friend, and he seemed blown away that I was accepting and affirming this part of my soul. I spent two full months working in that hospital, and it would not be for another four years that I would end up in the hospital again, this time in 1979, in less happy circumstances. As a 22-year-old, this time while studying in Quebec City at Université Laval, I traveled as a volunteer with Crossroads International, a group now supported for 35 years, to work in Niger in West Africa. Remember the Caribbean immigrant who could not imagine my blood to contain some black identity? Well, in Niger, I felt a sudden, raw, unexpected desire to seen and be recognized as black. I wanted people to notice my ancestry, to welcome me home as a long lost brother. I'd grown up in a white suburb, and here I was in trance with Africa, in love with the idea of connecting with my ancestral people for the first time. Oddly, 
inexplicably. I felt desperate to cast off my whiteness and be seen and recognized as black. Two weeks after arriving in Niger, I fell ill. I've never been sicker. I began vomiting and having extreme diarrhea. It went on for days and days. Within a week, I dropped 20 pounds and had gone from skinny to skeletal. I could no longer stand unassisted. My friends from Quebec, also unpaid volunteers with Crossroads International, saved my life when they lifted me into the back seat of a taxi and took me to the hospital. It was a poorly equipped, overcrowded hospital in one of the poorest nations on earth, but never matter. My friends took turns sleeping on a mattress beside my hospital bed and bringing me food and water. In Niger, when you're having a brush with death in the city's humble hospital, you had to rely on friends to bring you what you needed. The doctors and nurses made room, for, made room for me, diagnosed me as having gastroenteritis, and said that I had become anemic. They attached me to a blood bag and began a transfusion. I needed a few of them. I've always been squeamish about blood and needles, but I had to lay back and take it and come to terms with the blood bags that shrank so reluctantly as the red stuff dripped into my bloodstream. As I watched those blood bags shrink, I promised myself that if I survived, I'd become a writer. I'd write about what I was feeling. And here's what I felt. Did the blood come from an African donor? Did that make me more African? Did the blood come from Europeans and was I thus more white? Did it matter? What matters was the person or persons I will never meet or know gave blood of the same type as mine. What mattered was that our blood matched. As I gathered the strength to step out of that bed and walk again, I realized that it did not matter what people might see of my ancestry or imagine of my blood. I knew who I was. I could love equally the white people from Quebec with whom I was traveling and the people of Niger whom I was coming to know. One love did not preclude the other. I'd survived and had no reason to doubt my ancestry, provenance, who my parents were and who their ancestors were, tracing back to both Europe and Africa. This newfound calm helped me step confidently into adulthood. I traveled widely, gave generously. I stepped deeply into other cultures. I felt grounded. I had black and white ancestry, both. No part of my heritage negated the other. Both parts coexisted. One added to the other. I was ready to move past imagining my blood as if it were divided into distinct one liter bags of milk. Was I chocolate milk, whole milk, 2%, skim? We invented race to create social hierarchies. Today I'm ready to drop once and for all the idea that race and identity are lodged in the blood. Fears about identity, racial identity, and sexual identity, and about contamination tend to get concentrated in the world of blood donation. Some of you know the story of African-American doctor Charles Drew. He studied medicine at McGill University before becoming one of the world's most prominent blood plasma experts during the time of World War II. Much to his consternation and to the offense of many African-Americans who were anxious to prove their loyalty to their country in wartime, black blood was not allowed to be donated to white Americans, soldiers or civilians in the war when it finally became possible for thousands upon thousands of people to be transfused fairly easily. Even in the time of the Second World War, American physicians understood that the body of a sick or wounded person receiving plasma or other blood products would not distinguish between the blood of a black or a white donor. The blood exclusion decision had nothing to do with science and everything to, to do with society and politics. Today, in Canada and in most developed countries, there are still rules barring sexually active gay males from donating blood. It's only natural and understandable that in the wake of the tainted blood scandal that rocked Canada and other nations in the 1980s, authorities introduced restrictions on gay blood donors. At the time, we didn't even know about HIV. The science of blood testing has evolved significantly in the last 30 years, but the policies on gay blood donors have not kept pace. Currently, gay males can't give blood if they've had sex in the last five years. That's a very broad brush of exclusion. Even the American Medical Association is calling for a ban on gay donors to be lifted. Call, sorry, calling for the ban on gay blood donors to be lifted. And I'm hoping and predicting that in the next decade, Canadian authorities will find more focused and thoughtful ways to ensure that safe donors are solicited and unsafe donors excluded when it comes to giving the gift of life. Let's imagine that, there, that there, we're roaming the planet two centuries 
centuries from now, writing books, designing buildings, paddling canoes, and dethroning prime ministers, senators, and mayors. Let's say that we've not succumbed to complete and utter folly and exterminated ourselves through war, environmental destruction, or disease. If we survive as a species for another 200 years, enough time for our next six generations of descendants to be born and to procreate, we will surely look back with amusement and astonishment at how people think about blood today. Remember that as recently as the 18th century, a French physician in Paris was trying to calm a man's psychiatric disorders by transfusing the blood of a calf into him. Just imagine how people may speak of us in the future. There was this thing called leukemia, people might say. They had the insane idea of blasting the body with toxins and damn near killing a person, and then replacing the bone marrow so that the body could manufacture an entirely new batch of blood. It was not until the year 2079 that the Chinese physician Ling Jiaobo was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering how to create artificial blood, which eliminated need, the need for human blood transfusions. Who knows what we'll know in 200 years? None of us will be around to see it. We're still likely to be thinking about blood, and not just as a function of our health and vitality, but also in regard to how it defines us in our families and countries. From whom do we descend? To whom? Do we belong? What do we hope to transmit to our children and grandchildren and to their offspring? How does blood come to be associated with truth and, and integrity? Will we ever transcend the nasty tendency to vilify the blood of the ones we fear? We have nobody but ourselves to blame for these lapses in our humanity. There is nothing but our own prejudices blocking the way to a path that allows us to enjoy blood as a metaphor for our distinctiveness and group belonging without using it as an excuse to be the most convenient scapegoat. In the end, I hope blood will unite us. Blood fills our imaginations just as fully as it fills our veins. Thus, it has always been and will always be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Je suis Antonia Maioni, président de la Fédération des sciences humaines. Uh, I'm Antonia Maioni, president of the Federation of Social Sciences and Humanities. And I just want to say that one of the themes of this conference was this idea of moving uh, beyond borders, borders without boundaries. And I have to say that your talk was a real tour de force in showing us uh, how that is done, a real magistral in the interdisciplinary nature of your work, if we could say it from a scholar's point of view, uh, but that really came through. Thank you so much. Thank Lawrence. you. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Delighted we do have some here. time for questions, I'm happy to say, and um, uh, Lawrence Hill has generously offered to stay for some questions. Uh, the tradition at Brock University is to have a student ask that question. Uh, uh, so I'd like to call upon Sarah Lindsay, who's an MA student in critical sociology. Hello. Uh, just barely. Now? There yes. we go. I can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, gender, race, and class are all discussed in blood as subjective, with blood identified as both a divisive and shared biological component. Human animals are clearly the focus of this manuscript. However, I am curious as how the logic of shared equity and commonality in the form of blood translates into our relationship with non-human animals. Since certain non-human animals also rely on the presence and health of blood, does this cross or complicate a species barrier? Further, should blood be considered the only shared substance signifying life and lives worth living? In the case of non-human beings that do not possess the substance known as blood, are they somehow lesser than those that do? Is it the physical presence of blood which allows worth and equity, or is blood just the most tangible expression of this? Thank you for your question. I'm so interested in, <laughs> in this sort of interest in, in the blood and the life forms of non-human animals, particularly since for the first time in my life, and I'm 57, we just got a dog, and it's killing me. And, uh, um, but um, of course, when I was researching the book, um, 
I read of many horrifying incidents of research, you know, sometimes quite barbaric on, on animals, uh, experimentation with their blood, of course, um, the proof of, uh, uh, of contemporary theories of blood circulation, contemporary knowledge of blood circulation resided in the dissection of, of live dogs, you know, for, before scientists who could see before the very eyes how blood circulated in the body. Um, and so we've uh, using their blood, you know, to understand our own. And uh, I think it's interesting. You talk about the. Uh, you ask the question: Does our sort of the way we imagine the fullness of existence of an animal depend on whether or not it has blood? And you know, often, of course, we think that if an animal is especially cute, we shouldn't eat it. We have this conversation at home with our children: really cute animals shouldn't be eaten. You know, that's what they think because they can't somehow get their heads around the idea of consuming something that attractive. Um, and th that really comes down to a notion of imagining the life form in something. Some animals have different colored blood than red. Not all animals have red blood. Um, but uh, I, there's much to be thought about uh, in terms of animals and their blood uh, I, from a standpoint of research, from the standpoint of understanding how animals interact. But I'm um, the last thing from an expert on the matter, having just acquired my first animal. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, we have the two roving mic. On a, on a deux assistants qui sont là avec le microphone. Vous, uh, comme vous savez, uh, Lawrence Hill est bilingue. Donc, si vous voulez poser votre question en français, il n'y a pas de problème. Good afternoon, Lawrence. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Theophilus Ajay. I'm a MSW student at, a uh, graduate student at UFT, uh, Factor and Wintage uh, Faculty of Social Work. Uh, I just have a question uh, in regards to my own personal story. Uh, in my uh, undergraduate uh, experience at uh, BRAC, actually, uh, when I was doing my uh, political science BA here, uh, I, was, uh, I was inquiring about donating my blood, personally, uh, to, to the Canadian Blood Society. Could you please bring the mic a bit closer yeah. to your mouth? Thank so you. I was inquiring about donating my blood to the Canadian Blood Society. I saw like uh, them campaigning at the mall here. And I, me being a young student who wanted to, you know, really help out and, you know, change the world and everything, I actually took, went in through the process of going there and getting tested and uh, wanting to donate blood. Come to find out that, you know, I was all negative and that my blood could, you know, really potentially save a lot of lives. Uh, they told me that, unfortunately, I couldn't donate blood because uh, I wrote down on my, uh, on my application that I was born in West Africa at a certain period of time. So that kind of dropped my spirits down, kind of crushed me. And I just, I, I just struggled with that because I was wondering why. And then come to find out doing my research that uh, the reason being in their policy is because during a period of time where I was born, uh, there was a high prevalence of HIV in that area. Uh, so unfortunately, they couldn't accept my blood, even though it could save lives, you know. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Thank you for your question and for um, sharing that personal story. Um, Wait, you can't hear? Oh. You okay, can't hear me? Mic issue. Hmm? Is my mic off? I think so. Can you hear me now? Oh, um, we'll just wait for a minute and see if we can get the mic back up. And if we can't, I could always move to the other mic and answer from there. Shall I do that until, yes, yes. until we do get this one fixed? Do no, I don't mind at all. Can you hear me again now? Yes. OK, sorry about that. Were you able to hear the question that was asked? All right, well, thank you for asking the question. And I think that. Um, of course, your, your frustration is not uh, unique, sadly. Uh, many people have been turned down when they've wanted to give blood, even when they thought or they believed, or they probably were entirely healthy. And there, there's a, a long list of exclusionary policies that people will learn as they go to donate blood, uh, who's, ex who's allowed to donate, who is not. And of course, if you've traveled or been born in or lived in certain countries, especially in certain times, you're not eligible in Canada to donate blood. And of course, these are entirely uh, subjective policies. Uh, when you think of it, um, uh, if you lived in a certain time in the UK, you're not allowed to donate because you might have been exposed to mad cow disease. 
Um, but do you think that applies to people who are living, donating blood in the UK? Of course it doesn't. Uh, are, are, are medical authorities in the UK saying you can't donate blood here because you lived in this country uh, 20 years ago? Are people telling that to donors of blood in various African nations that they can't donate because they were born and they lived in, in, that, in that very nation? These policies do, do vary from country to country. Even the policies on, on uh, exclusionary policies having to do with gay males vary significantly from country to country. Some countries have lifted that ban entirely. Uh, Mexico would be one example. Others have, have not. Um, but it's very hard uh, when you want to give, when you want to give the ultimate gift uh, that nobody will thank you for, nobody will know who that you gave, nobody will know whose blood went into the, whose body. It's very hard to be rejected in that way. and, and uh, um, I think we have to give a great deal of thought to the most uh, intelligent ways to select blood and ensure that it's safe, but not to exclude people unnecessarily. So I'm sorry you had to go through that. And I knew from the minute you started speaking where that story was going. And um, I'm sorry, it must have been uh, very hurtful. I can't donate for various reasons either. I, because I got malaria while working in, in, uh, uh, where, in, uh, Mali, and also because I had the blood transfusion in uh, Niger, or the transfusions, I, I'm not eligible to, to donate either, sadly, and I would love to, but I, but I can't. Thank you. No disrespect, but we had a family member that died from a blood transfusion. Um, a few years ago, the Red Cross got it really messed up. So it's truly tragic, but keep giving blood if you can. I know my family, my family does as well. Um, I like to talk about blood. We have over 800 women that have disappeared from the reserves in Northern Canada. I think that's blood. Um, they've disappeared. And the police can say all kinds of interesting things about, you know, they've done their duties and that type of thing. We also have a number of other issues with different groups of people that are in poverty in this country. And their children seem to be taken far more often into foster care, which is a, practically a business. And in the province of Ontario, we've had over 600 deaths directly related to foster care. We have over 700 in Alberta. I would like your opinion. I strongly feel that we need the ombudsman in every single a government institution, so we have a third party investigate, so we can get all this mess straightened up rather than cover up, cover up. Your opinions, please. My opinion on the, on the issue of foster care and on its viability? Well, it's a little bit beyond my area of expertise. Um, I know that certainly in researching this book, uh, there's a great deal of controversy about the uh, placing thousands upon thousands of of uh, indigenous children in Manitoba in, in the foster care and, and often being sent off to the United States or to other parts of their families. And it produced a re the Kimmelman report was written as a result of this sort of uh, uh, form of social genocide. It's an issue that's extremely important. Uh, on one hand, of course, we want to keep families and communities together. And on the other hand, sometimes we're presented with compelling need and, and children need to be placed in safe situations and how do you square these two often competing interests keep communities and families together whenever humanly possible which should be a priority for all of us and on the other hand ensuring the safety of children who are sometimes uh like it or not in, in dangerous situations but um your question falls really quite far outside my area of expertise so i think i'm going to leave it at there for the beginning of an answer thank you Hi, I'm going to lighten the, um, the mood here a little bit. Um, I, as you were speaking, I couldn't help but think about uh, the HBO series uh, True Blood and uh, the sort of vogue of vampire fiction and vampire movies. And I was wondering, as you were doing your research and writing your essays and your book, if you thought about the sort of the meaning of the, the centuries-old vampire stories and myths. I, I have had a chance to think about it when I was researching it. And also, um, you know, I have uh, four daughters who've all been or currently still are teenagers. And it's pretty well impossible to have 
a teenage daughter and not have a fixation on vampires in the, in the family. I challenge you to find a 16-year-old girl who doesn't know every vampire uh, TV show going. It's quite fascinating how uh, this was, I was born in 57, so I, you know, I was a teenager in the 70s, and I, I just was not seeing at the time such a fixation on, on vampires in, in popular culture, TVs and literature. Uh, and of course, uh, wizards too, when you think about it, um, the entire, I, th I read the entire Harry Potter series, which I did read carefully because four of my five children read those books many times over and so I felt I should at least try to keep up with them and see what the fuss was about. So I did read uh, all of the J.K. Rowling um, books, the Harry Potter books, and fundamentally I think that the series is a meditation on, on the Holocaust, it's a meditation on, on on the forces of good and evil. The evil people in the J.K. Rowling series, Harry Potter, are trying to exterminate those wizards of impure blood. And the, the good people in the series are trying to protect uh, those who are of impure blood and trying to vanquish those who would perpetuate genocide against impure-blooded or mud-blooded wizards. So millions and millions of children around the world are reading probably one of the most popular books ever written, which is entirely a meditation on blood purity, which I find fascinating. Um, how it's come to be that we've become so obsessed with vampires and wizards and blood, I don't quite know. Uh, maybe it's because, you know, vampires can keep having sex forever. They're, <laughs> once, they, once they cross over into the dark side, they're perpetually young and virile and powerful. Uh, they can rip people apart in a second. They never age. They're never gonna be human again, but they never age. There's something about the ultimate enduring strength you know, of a vampire, a sexual strength and physical strength that seems to be completely, you know, seductive to, to uh, so many of us. I've never been that excited by vampire literature or vampire culture, and it befuddles me that so many people around me are. But again, I'm sure that if you have a daughter, especially who's a teenager, teenager you're likely to have seen her watching, you know, at least a few uh, vampire shows, and it's, it's really quite striking. Uh, just take a take a list that I've just finished watching a writing. I mean a co-writing a TV miniseries And so I sort of had to become more and more aware of what's popular out there and uh, It is incredible how many of the most popular shows are rooted in blood and things vampiric Question here and then another question in the back There's a hand right here. Here and in the back. Yeah. Yes. You're just about to receive a mic, I believe. Thank you. Hi, Hi. Lawrence. Um, I'm Claudine Bonner. And I have a question um, really talking about the movement that we've seen lately in the last uh, maybe decade or so in the African-American community in particular in terms of not so much as of a focus on blood for identity, but looking at DNA analysis, so things like Skip Gates, um, mm -hmm. you know, with his foundation, and you can actually find out where you originated, what's your lineage, and people like Oprah finding out, you know, she's South African, or all these things. Like, what are your thoughts in terms of that movement away from blood so much and more into DNA analysis? It's a fascinating field, and it's it's fascinating to think of the thousands upon thousands of. Uh, Canadians and Americans, including many African Canadians and many African Americans who sort of embraced the DNA search for their identity. And I've, I've often stopped to ask myself about this. And of course, you know, the African Canadian and the African American experience is relatively unique in that we, in the New World, uh, basically, if we descend from slaves, and of course, um, if we descend from slaves, uh, we have very little way of knowing through traditional genealogical research where we truly came from. And so we are really divorced from our past. You can't know. The chances are one in a million that you could find out with any confidence where your families originated from if you descend from slaves. Even Alex Haley made it up, you know, in, in writing Roots. Uh, so 
um, it's understandable, you know, when you feel so divorced from your past, when you can't say, this is the country or the village that my people came from, or these are the countries and villages that you can embrace a new technology. My sense is that the uh, DNA testing is still um, in, in full evolution. Uh, many people report uh, having multiple tests and getting multiply different answers from different tests. Even Oprah apparently got three different answers uh, from three different tests about where her ancestors might actually be from. Um, much of it depends on the size of the pool of people that they're testing, say, in various African nations. And if the pool is quite small, that limits the ability of us to really know uh, you know, what they are. Often, I'm told, uh, there's room for interpretation in those results as well. And so um, I, I read something about that too. I think it's natural that we'd be looking for any way possible to conduct sleuthing missions, you know, into our ancestry. So I, I'd be interested in, in experimenting, looking around and taking some tests too. But I think I, I'd also be, you know, happily skeptic, skeptical about the results that came in. So it's, it's natural. If we have a tool at our availability, we we'll want to use it and see what we can find out. But uh, many skeptics that I've read say that we should still be reading those results with, with a grain of salt. Good afternoon, Mr. Hill. Uh, I really appreciate your lecture today, and uh, uh, now I'm a, doing my master at Brock. Um, I remember that in your last uh, in your last uh, sentence, you prob I, uh, you said that I hope blood united us. So my question is that what changes can we make to make blood more of a uniting factor across the world? Thank you. Thank you. What changes can we make to, to ensure that blood is more of a uniting factor across the world? Yeah. Um, well, I think that we, when we are at our most evil, we either consciously or subconsciously make these direct connections between identity and blood. We boil down our identity to blood parts. And I think it's a very dangerous thing. It starts with something that seems kind of innocent, but in my opinion, ridiculous. Like if we say, as we do so commonly, it's, a, it's such common language that we often don't stop to really think about what we're saying. Well, I know this person and she's one quarter Korean, one quarter Chinese, and half black. As if you could truly measure a person's identity by blood parts or body parts. Um, how often do we hear people quantifying uh, racial identity uh, in measuring it as if it could be measured in, in units of blood, this much of this type, this much of this type. It's a ludicrous notion, of course. Uh, identity is a social construction. It, it can't be um, defined by, by examining one's blood parts. Um, and so if we at least can be conscious of this sort of subconscious tendency to link identity and blood, to quantify our blood in, in parts of identity, then perhaps we'll be a little more wary the next time a desperate, you know, is calling for the elimination of a people as a result of their so-called impure blood. And it is frightening to think of all the genocides, uh, so many genocides that have been perpetuated over the, over the centuries have come down over and over again to people attempting to justify these heinous acts by to the impurity of the blood of their victims. Okay, one last question. Thank you. Oh, two last questions. Hello. Oh, I'll come to you too if you'd like to. I see your mic there. Where is the person speaking now? I'm sorry, I don't see you. At the front. Oh, thank you. Hi. <laughs> You're in the darkness. Um, so my understanding is in some kind of East Asian cultures, when, they're, when uh, writers are writing fiction and they're describing characters, they'll figure blood type very prominently into the character, uh, you know, and it factors into their personality and how their personalities are. And I was wondering when you were writing your book using blood as a literary device, um, I think in some ways the kind of scientific knowledge of blood is a lot less poetic <laughs> than the kind of metaphorical takes that we take on it. And I'm wondering, did you feel that you were, that you were taking liberties with the truth about blood or that you were finding a sort of truth that you know the scientific knowledge we have about blood can't tell. 
I didn't feel I was taking liberties with knowledge as I understood it. In, if you're referring to blood, the stuff of life, I didn't make up anything that I, uh, that I believed to be false. I, I wrote as accurately as I, I could. So I didn't uh, take liberties in terms of um, my understanding of, say, certain medical facts or facts related to blood. I did read a lot about blood and blood parts and how blood works and all the parts. I wrote a little bit about it. I felt that my best contribution would be more, more to speak about it sociologically than to speak about it medically. And then the best thing to do would be to leave blood as, as, a, as a biological phenomenon to the experts and bring something fresh to the table that I could do. So I didn't take liberties with truth as I understood it. But I certainly uh, employed my imagination to, to think about how notions of blood influence our thinking. And I guess my point in, in, in the essays is that, uh, and in the book is that blood is much more than just a fascinating and vital fluid that courses through our bodies. Blood is also uh, a metaphor that we constantly resort to in our religions and in our literature, in our times of war, in our relations, in our, in our social our elaboration, our elaboration of, say, what constitutes cheating in sport or what constitutes um, uh, genocide. Uh, blood looms very large in, in the ways that we see ourselves and interact with each other, as well as being a substance in our veins. And that's where my imagination uh, you know, kicked in to really try to understand that more deeply, but not in terms of uh, concocting uh, or creating uh, falsities with regard to uh, the physical properties of blood. That I'll leave to the novels. Oh, sorry, can we take one last question? Of course, question? yes. Okay. I'm sorry that you were stymied there. Thank you. Um, thanks for problematization of the racialization, but I want to go back to the womanhood. Um, and despite you talked about Aristo, how Aristo taught about the fact that how you can trust someone who bleed for like five days and still alive. Um, but your definition of womanhood was to a certain extent related to menstruation, and you talked about it. My worry is that if we still go with that discourse, we eliminate women who cannot bleed. It is very ageist because it talks to a particular period of time as well as trans women, because the definition of womanhood cannot be only defined by menstruation, so I was wondering if you can comment on that, and in what ways that can provide a new possibility for us to think about peace and justice, and it's related to what uh, the social, uh, critical sociology student asked about thinking about subjectivity. That's a good point, uh, and thank you for, for making it. I, I wouldn't want to suggest that one was somehow less human when one could no longer, less womanly when one could no longer bleed or one's body was no longer producing uh, monthly periods. I, I meant to sort of meditate on the ways in which menstruation affects our thinking about men and women, our thinking about relations between the sexes, but not to suggest that uh, the absence of bleeding meant, made, made one less of a woman. So your point is very well taken. Again, your point is well taken. Uh, there's, there's a limit to how far this can go, but uh, in the context of what I was discussing, I was interested in how blood and menstrual blood does fit into our imagination about identity and womanhood and, and its relation to manhood. But that's not to say that there aren't many other ways to imagine people and to bring them together and to respect them in their own ways. I'm going to have you sit here of course. for one more moment. And I want you all to join me in uh, thanking Lawrence Hill. I think it was John Kennedy who said that um, he wished there had been more poets in politics in the American context. I wish we had more thoughtful writers like Lawrence Hill taking on uh, these kinds of topics that do have policy relevance and do break a break a lot of boundaries in doing so. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Thank you. I'd like to add, Lawrence Hill will be uh, joining us just outside these doors for a book signing uh, right after the lecture, so I encourage you to stay for that. There will also be a panel at 2.30 uh, with Lawrence Hill, and I hope that you will come back to this very room 
uh, is that right, at 2.30 for that panel. I'd like to thank the Royal Society of Canada for co-sponsoring this talk and to the larger universe of sponsors of the Big Thinking Lecture Series, including uh, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Can Canadian Foundation for Innovation, uh, and also our partners at the Association for the Universities and Colleges of Canada, Genome Canada, and the Trudeau Foundation. It's been a pleasure to host this uh, Big Thinking Lecture Series and to have it end on such a high note with Lawrence Hill. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup à tous.